This video was brought to you by the TLDR socials. Get more from TLDR by following us on Instagram and Twitter, where we post explainers that never make it to YouTube. The link is down below. It's an interesting quirk of history right now that the very first leader of the Labour Party shares his name with the current leader. Keir Hardy is seen as a hero in the Labour movement, a man who founded the party and set them up to eventually win elections and make fundamental changes to the country. The question is, can his namesake do the same? To answer this, it's worth looking at how he differs from other Labour leaders, specifically his predecessor, Jeremy Corbyn. Both Starmer and Corbyn appear to represent different factions within the Labour Party. Starmer seems to be more centrist, leaning on more moderate policies and attempting to put electoral credibility above ideology, while Corbyn seems to be more left-wing, favouring more socialist policies, putting ideology above electoral credibility. Starmer has, in recent days, made clear that he's trying to change the Labour Party to better reflect his own views of what the party should be, and one that, in his eyes, can start winning elections again. The three biggest commitments that Starmer has made are to 1. Make the manifesto a serious plan for government 2. Change the mechanism to elect the Labour leader and 3. Accept the positives of the new Labour movement To understand whether these three changes will lead Starmer to number 10, let's have a look through history and see whether other leaders making similar changes have put the party in a better or worse position. Let's start by having a look at a more modern manifesto. And there's quite a good parallel in history for this. Back in 1979, the Labour Party lost the election to Margaret Thatcher. Labour were in a bad place and had just presided over the winter of discontent, a period where various economic problems, mainly rising from inflation rates and numerous strikes, halted many public services, including bin men emptying bins, grave diggers burying bodies and tanker drivers delivering fuel. The Labour leader at the time, coming out of not only this crisis, but the loss of power to Margaret Thatcher, decided to resign, and a left-wing leader named Michael Foote took charge of the party. Largely, it's down to the leader to determine the party's manifesto, and Foote decided to include manifesto promises such as unilateral nuclear disarmament, withdrawal from the EEC, the precursor to the EU, and the abolition of the House of Lords. These policies were not looked upon favourably by the public, and they undoubtedly contributed to Labour's defeat in the 1983 election, at the time the worst election defeat for Labour in post-war history. Following this defeat, Foote resigned and it was Neil Kinnock who took charge of the party next. He spent his first few years battling with the left-wing faction of the party, known as Militant Tendency, and trying to limit their influence. As such, he headed into the 1987 election with a manifesto that scrapped a lot of the policies he felt veered too far left, such as the withdrawal from the EEC. Now, Kinnock still lost the 1987 election, but he gained 20 seats from 1983, and Labour had a 3.2 swing in their favour. Starmer seems to have committed himself to similar changes made by Kinnock in the 1980s. In his speech to conference a couple of weeks ago, Starmer said, I say these simple but powerful words. We will never, under my leadership, go into an election with a manifesto that is not a serious plan for government. Reading between the lines, Starmer, like Kinnock, wants to update the manifesto and get rid of policies that the public find untenable. But will this work for Keir? And did it work for Kinnock? Well, some would argue that this is a good move from Starmer. While Neil Kinnock never became Prime Minister, Many who follow this line of argument would credit him as starting the necessary modernising changes that were necessary for Labour to regain electoral credibility, and that further modernisation under Labour leaders like John Smith and Tony Blair eventually led to victory in 1997. However, opponents of this argument would claim that the Manifesto of 1983 didn't actually contribute much to Labour's defeat. There were many other things going on. The Conservatives had just won a war in the Falklands, and their opposition was literally fracturing. A group of Labour MPs had split off to form a new party called the SDP. In the grand scheme of things, the argument goes, Foote's manifesto didn't make a huge difference. All it did really was antagonise Labour's core and most loyal supporters. So whether history suggests that Starmer's heading in the right direction depends on how important you think manifesto commitments actually are for elections. Okay, so moving on to the second big change that Starmer's been attempting to make, how the leader of the Labour Party is elected. 
This has been a particularly hot topic for the Labour Party for a number of years now. Until 1981, the Labour Party selected its leader through a secret ballot, specifically of just MPs. A change was then made to allow other groups a say in the selection. The new system gave the trade unions, who are a large reason why the Labour Party even exists, 40% of the vote, Labour MPs 30% of the vote, and constituency Labour parties 30% of the vote. This was known as the Electoral College system. This system was then modified by Labour leader John Smith, who removed the 40% union vote, meaning that MPs and Labour voters got a 50-50 say. Ed Miliband then in 2014 completed the transition, and introduced one member, one vote, which gave party members complete control over the leader. The key thing to note here is that in order to qualify, MPs needed support from 5% of Labour Party MPs. And in 2015, 5% translated to 35 Labour MPs. And Corbyn only just managed to pass this threshold, with 36 MPs backing him in total. Starmer has, in the last week, managed to get a proposal through that will double the requirements for candidates seeking leadership of the party, from 5% to 10%. Theoretically, as leadership candidates require more MPs behind them, this should reduce the chances of fringe candidates making it to the public ballot. John Smith tried to achieve a similar goal when he removed the trade union vote, as they often backed fringe left-wing candidates. Both leaders have, in effect, tried to stop more left-wing leaders from getting the helm of the party. Smith's reforms arguably paved the way for Tony Blair's leadership, a centrist who led Labour to victory. Those in favour of Starmer's recent changes will likely claim that this is a victory, and that it's now made it harder for candidates like Corbyn, who led Labour to its worst defeat since 1935, to get into leadership. Those on the left of the party, though, will argue that this change is massively undemocratic, and that Corbyn's leadership led to a huge surge in membership, and even came close to victory in 2017. And it could even be said that excluding candidates like Corbyn will discourage the more left-leaning membership, and force the party even closer to the centre. So ultimately, whether this is a good move will depend on whether you think left-wing leaders are a good thing for the Labour Party or not. Moving to the third and final commitment from Starmer, we got to hear his vocal support for new Labour policies. Ever since New Labour fell from power, and even a bit before, Labour politicians have been a bit hesitant to really vocally back them. With the legacy of Blair's war in Iraq, one of the biggest reasons for their hesitation. Despite the stigma, at the Labour Party conference, Starmer hesitantly started singing the praises of New Labour in government, with him saying, If they want to know how to do it, I suggest they take a look at our record the last time we were in government. <laughs> Hospital weights down. GCSO results up. 44,000 more doctors. 89,000 new nurses. <laughs> Child poverty down 1 million. Pensioner poverty down 1 million. Rough sleepers down 75%. A national minimum wage. Although he didn't mention New Labour by name, it's clear who he was referencing. It's also clear then that Starmer sees himself as a Labour moderniser, akin to Kinnock, Smith and Blair and he's working hard to distance Labour from the Corbyn era. The public appear to agree too, with them seeing him most akin to Blair of recent Labour leaders, and more people viewed him as doing well during his first 100 days than either Miliband or Corbyn. However, he isn't doing particularly great in the polls. Labour are still behind, despite the huge number of crises currently going on in the UK. As ever in politics, whether Starmer will do well depends on your view of history, and how you measure his success. There's a strong argument that he's a moderniser, and modernisers have historically done well. There's also the argument that he's not offering a radical policy programme. For some, this is good news, but it is turning away supporters who backed Labour in 2017 when they did come closer to victory. But what do you think? Is Starmer on a path to victory or electoral oblivion? Let us know your thoughts in the comments below. Also, be sure to follow us on Twitter and Instagram for more TLDR content.
You can follow just the TLDR UK socials, or go wild, and follow whichever TLDR accounts interest you. Anyway, following and sharing our posts not only gets you more from us, but it also really helps us out, so thanks a lot. And of course, be sure to subscribe to the channel and hit the bell icon to be notified every time we release a new video. Special thanks to our Patreon backers who make videos like this one possible, and if you want to see your name at the end of videos, then you too can back us on Patreon. The link to that is in the description.